So we went from the thing for itself uh, into a conditional universal and then arrived at a new object that took, took us into an unconditional universal and somehow the thing is the thing with properties and those properties were uh, first uh, determined by perception but uh, after, uh, retrospectively not really it all had to do with the universal that we extracted from it and that we're sort of seen through a priori because we conceptualize as we go uh, and now we live in a world of forces uh, I have I'm not even gonna try to make sense on this video if anyone arrives here because I'm probably gonna put a clickbait video such as the hardest thing that Hegel ever wrote or anything like that uh, this is the fifth or sixth video of many that I've made on the phenomenology of spirit I'm going uh, chapter by chapter sometimes page by page trying to understand it I am no lecturer or professor or anything like that as it will have made itself evident by now for those of you who are paying deep attention uh, but uh, I am eager to understand, uh, to see, I, I, I have incredible FOMO and also I'm arrogant enough to want to know things so that others don't know for the sake of knowing things that others don't know uh, especially in philosophical circles since uh, I really can notice I can understand other people's arrogance or pedantry when it's not founded because mine, of course, especially mine, is founded uh, <laughs> I am the exception to all rules, of course but um, I'm struggling I'm struggling to make sense of anything that's happening here uh, this was not easy I... I just... I no longer know what to supplement the reading with without having to like get a whole new book to understand this one but I have had uh, some help from a lecturer at my university and uh, also media help, friends help and after a lot of uh, pain I feel like I might have understood something so let's open chapter 3 in page number 1 of chapter 3 and go paragraph by paragraph uh, highlighting basically reading my notes until as, as I did until now and seeing what how they do interact with the text reading the highlighted areas trying to make sense of it uh, together if anyone uh, somehow has now decided to join or has joined but I did not know about because so far this is a very solipsistic video I believe I'm just talking to myself here unlike Hegel he, Hegel is not as solipsistic as he might seem um, yeah, let me know if I am, if I overlook anything throughout this chapter, if I misunderstand something, which I'm sure I do, uh, or anything else. It's option three for all other options. Uh, yeah, so chapter three Force and the Understanding, Appearance of the Supersensible World. So we go, very important, we go from properties to force, the properties of the thing. The force that changes, that um, is the fuel of, uh, of those changes in which the thing constantly um, becomes. Uh, so, yeah, we have um, paragraph 132, 132, and I highlighted this. This unconditioned universal, referring to what we talked on the previous video, which is now the true object of consciousness, is still just an object for it. Consciousness has not yet grasped the notion of the unconditioned as notion. Notion or concept, up to you. It is essential to distinguish the two. For consciousness, the object has returned into itself. It re uh, has returned into, its into itself from its relation to an other and thus become notion in principle. That seems to be important because I extra highlighted it. But consciousness is not yet for itself the notion and consequently does not recognize itself in that reflected object. And what I wrote on the side says, so first of all, notion in principle as opposed to notion in practice, uh, which is to say it is not realized in an empirical sense. It's a notion in principle. Now let's see 
what it wrote on the sides. The concept is still an object to consciousness. It does not yet grasp it, it, yeah, it does not yet grasp it as itself. Insofar as the understanding can grasp the concept of itself, it is in principle that notion. Do you follow? Um, so yeah, it's grasping an object that is only concept is not just realizing the world. And uh, insofar as the understanding can grasp the concept of itself, it is in principle that notion. In principle, as opposed in practice, because again, it's a concept of itself. Now we jump forward because I'm, I'm as I said, I'm, I'm not even gonna try to make a lot of sense of this chapter. It's supposed to be the hardest chapter. Um, I'm, I don't think it's as hard as it is obscure. Because I've seen people explain this chapter in a very legible way, which means that it can be written in a legible way. And more often than not, as it's always the case with philosophy, whenever I read a paragraph that has uh, 200 sentences, uh, those 200 sentences could be summarized in 10 sentences that would be not only more legible, but more accurate. And I do think that that is partially what's happening here. Uh, Hegel is just another example, yet another example, of a bad writer in philosophy. Which is not to say that his philosophy um, amounts to nothing. Otherwise, I would not be reading here. I'm, I'm giving him a chance as a philosopher, not as a writer. As a writer, I can't tell from page one that is sh shit. So now we go to one for one. And whew, I'm going to read all for one for one. Uh, no, that's a long... Uh, because I, I just highlighted the whole thing. Uh, so maybe read one for one. And um, yeah, see vanishing forces, although force is an object of the understanding. Yeah, so force's essence, and this is where the force is sort of emerges, uh, force's, uh, force's essence as it exhibits itself in and for itself. It is force in the form of its true essence, in which it exists only as an object for the understanding. Um, that is the main thing. That is the main thing that you need to understand here, is that force connects us with uh, the, 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 the loss. Because the force is the thing that unites the beginning and the end of the dialectical process, of, the, of contraposition. So the force is the change. The change is that which allows us to make sense of the whole. The force is the, the, the glue in between every single stage. And, um, and through that force, we can arrive at loss. Now, in, uh, in 144, um, he says, within this inner truth as the absolute... Mm -hmm. Should I... Yeah, I'll read the 144 first and then I'll read the rest of my note. Uh, within this inner truth as the absolute universal which has been purged, of the antithesis between the universal and individual and has become the object of the understanding, there now opens up above the sensuous world. Sensuous world. Which is to say, the world of the appearance. A supersensible world, a non-sensuous world, uh, which henceforth is the true world. Above the vanishing present world, therefore opens up permanent, a permanent beyond and in itself, which is the first and therefore imperfect appearance of reasons, of reason, or only the pure element in which the truth has its essence. This looks a lot more mystic and idealist uh, than it actually is. So from that force the, uh, that promotes the change and creates that pattern of, of change that some how has a unity that is separate from the individual pieces, we arrive at the loss. And um, so you go from, from a world over which you have no responsibility, a sensuous world, to one in which you have all the responsibility, the super sensibility. The world is not partially responsible for what we know. We are responsible for understanding it we have to make sense of it. Um, not only are we, but we can help but do that. Uh, we move far further forward. I'll read afterwards uh, some other notes that I have on the computer. 
that might help you make sense of this whole thing. I encourage you to read um, paragraph 150. Um, but the main thing that you want to extract from there is that the cognitive defect of ref um, relying on the con the cognitive defect of relying on the concept of a law is um, is the loss of particularity is the uh, is that the generality of laws ignores the particular it, and unifies a set of phenomena its unity is indifferent to plurality you can only drive on one side of the road regardless of the number of uh, wheels that your car has and regardless of the number of cars that there are in your country, but maybe in a specific context, if there was only one car in a whole country, it would not really matter in which side of the road you ride. You ride, however, you still have to follow that law. So it ignores particularity. There is a nice essay by Nietzsche that I always talk about, which is the on truth in line and a moral sense, in which he talks about sort of like how we create the concept of um, a plant or a leaf. And when we when I say leaf, you imagine leaf, the concept of leaf, the idea of leaf. But um, if you actually look at the world, like I'm just looking through the window right now, I can see 15 different types of leaves. And uh, every single one of them has more things that um, make them different from each other, radical, radically different, than things that make them similar. So we're ignoring all of those differences for the following of like a universalizing concept and no overarching concept. Um, let me just to catch up because we're getting, I don't know, we're not getting close to the end. Yeah, okay. So let's just keep going. 155. Um, yeah, this is talking about the tautological movement of the understanding. Um, it is an explanation that not only explains nothing, but it, it is so plain that while it pretends to say something different from what has already been said, really says nothing at all, uh, uh, but only repeats the same thing. So laws are tautological bachelors. Um, laws are tautological. Example, bachelors are a married man. Or if you throw something, it, it, it falls uh, due to gravity. Um... Yeah, basically you are just describing an event. The law is the law is irrelevant for the event that is happening, and um, the laws are drawn in that way. So laws are extracted from from the force, but laws in themselves are tautological. They don't really make the force. They are not the thing that makes the force um, have its motion. They are just the way in which we conceptualize that force in a, a more predictable, classifiable way. <laughs> Um, so we have uh, what, what knowing is manifest. Uh, no, uh, what knowing is manifested in universal terms, um, but not conditioned by sensibility. We also um, show exceptions to um, yeah so, uh, the exceptions of perception and yeah ah okay this is what I'm not reading yeah so just. Check the whole of 156 and paragraph 157. And in 157, I'll, I'll read the paragraph 157, but um, I recommend you to read 156 first. It's, Through this principle, the first supersensible world, the tranquil kingdom of laws, the immediate copy of, perceived, uh, of uh, the perceived world is changed into its opposite. The law was in general like its difference, that which remains self-same. Now, however, it is posited that each of the war of the two worlds is really the opposite of itself. The self same really repels itself from itself, and what is not self same really posits itself as self same. Um, oh yeah, we're going into the world of inversion. In point of fact, it is only this is a, another term that uh, Hegel makes in this chapter that uh, makes everything even more difficult. And I don't really see the point behind it, but let's look at it. In point of fact, it is only one does determine that the difference is inner difference or difference in its own self. The like being um, unlike itself and the unlike like itself. This second supersensible world is in this way the inverted world and moreover, since one aspect is already present in the first supersensible world, the inversion 
of the first. With this, the inner world is completed as appearance. For the first supersensible world was only the immediate race, uh, rising um, of the perceived world into universal element. It had its necessary counterpart in this perceived world, which is still retained for itself the principle of change and alteration. The first kingdom of laws lacked that principle but obtains it as an inverted world. So the law of appearance itself is um, the understanding, which is just um, Geist, um, the spirit, and is what Hegel calls the principle of change. And the, what the Hegel calls the principle of change is the one thing that happens outside of the understanding. Laws are um, laws are the thing that happen, but the principle of change is is the fact that things happen at all. And uh, sorry, my calligraphy is not great, and I write in odd places, so I'm I'm struggling to follow here. Um, thus, the understanding is limited in terms of its uh, imposing capacity. And on the end of the paragraph, uh, from the the first presentable world all the way to the end of the paragraph, uh, I wrote the first world changes into the second world, inverts its loss in order to offer an account of loss. Let's look at the inversion, what I, what I wrote about the inversion here. Yeah, so that's the tautology of the inverting world, uh, which brings us to another inversion. Um, the supersensible world is the image, uh, the, is the stable image of the play of forces, but through the tautological explanation, we arrive at the law. Um, which is uh, um, opposed to what we called uh, uh, the, what to, which is exactly the opposite of the law that we had before. Um, which is to say that the difference that it was uh, constant and equal at first now is inconstant and uh, unequal. Um, which is to say the the previous law. Uh, Which is, yeah, that's it. I'm just repeating myself here. So what Hegel is trying to show is a reduction ad, ad absurdum in, in, in this passage. Like the inverted world is a, is a mockery. Um, we have to stop um, fixating ourselves, like focusing on the idea of a distinct element um, from those differences, from the difference that we already had a priori. Um, these differences being ideas, um, laws, or any other thing beyond um, in the in the beyond. In order to think uh, pure thought, as fun as as uh, funny as that sounds. Um, all right, yeah. He's trying to he's kind of trying to escape as some sort of his mysticism here by by negating this invert world uh, the world in uh, that we can know is that which adjusts to its limits of the understanding the contradictions of uh, the co of consciousness um are due to the concepts and distinctions that it uses the postulation of the of the super sensible world um Yeah, in the, in the postulation of the super sensible world, um, we have that idealism that is only like halfway through. It's not it's not full idealism. It's the idealism in so far as it's focusing on something that is beyond the that is based, m m merely based on the mental world uh, rather than the empirical one, uh, like Platonic ideas. But it's uh, only halfway there because um, consciousness is that which is per uh, be because uh, consciousness perceives it as something external to itself uh, from its activity of thought. Um, so in chapter three so far we have the first object of consciousness is the force. The second object is the law that comes from the force as a unity uh, that is undifferentiated because on the force we have this constant change which you cannot trace the force but you can you cannot trace like the force as um, you cannot fixate the force, define the force but you can define its pattern and in that pattern, you can extract a law, gravity, for example. 
Øhm. Um, and uh, it is through that law that we can finally provide an explanation in terms of the of the abstract force um, of of that gravity that unifies everything. The explanation um, does not explain exactly um, the thing that obs that it observes. Uh, like no, it, 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 yeah. It does not explain the thing that that exists, but. It, it, it observes the thing that already exists, the thing that is observing, but it doesn't uh, explain the world itself. Um, the answer is tautological. Yeah, that's a nice example. So the answer is tautological because of... Uh, this is something that science does a lot. Um, why does... Why do you have depression? And a scientific answer would be because the, there are mechanisms, hormones... Um, because the, the powers of um, there are things with the property of depression inside your brain that trigger certain that trigger that behavior. Um, because there are you have a dopamine you have to, you have chronic uh, lack of dopamine, or you have um, why do you have anxiety because uh, your serotonin levels are um, dysregulated. So what they are saying is. You have depression because things in your brain. Uh, brain are making you have depression. Do you see how that is not an answer? Do you see how that does not explain why those things? Like the, you can continue to ask the question, why do those things uh, make your brain behave in that way? There is no answer. That is why he said uh, back in the previous page that the answer given to that law tends to be tautological. It's just describing an event as it is. It's not explaining it. It's explaining its occurrence. That's what I was trying to write there, um, not very successfully. Um, yes, so... And this this is what I mean by these videos are sort of like us making sense of the video uh, together. At the end of the video is when I arrive at a better understanding of what I just read. Because this you're supposed to read 10 times, I'm not going to read this 10 times. Uh, I read it once and then I come here and we read it together, look at it together. Um, but uh, yeah, I that makes much more sense now. So, objects of the understanding. Um, yes, this is um, one, one, um, paragraph 160. Uh, is talking about the objects of, of the understanding, uh, which are concepts of force, law and change. And um, they... It's like an important premise is that, well, it also, the summary, change is the essence of appearances. And which is, that means that something would, uh, wouldn't be an appearance if it didn't change. That's probably why before, at the beginning, we said that uh, forces are sheer vanishing. Um, because that that is the expression of force. Um, the force is a forward movement in in which, in a sense, is like a never vanishing force, a, a, a never vanishing motion. It vanishes in the sense that it 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 is left behind every time it moves forward. Um, in one six two. Wow. Change, yeah. Uh, one six two. He says um, change is an appearances pure essence. What does that mean? I wonder. Um, well, I wrote here, the structures of the understanding are inescapable, I, are an uh, inescapable thing already, uh, as, an, as an inescapable thing already show up the colors of the understand, already show up in the colors of the understanding, on the, on the understanding. We can basically not, we can't escape the structures of the understanding. The understanding comes before. You don't see every single cell of the plant, then the bud, then the flower, then the leaf, then the roots, and then the plant. You see the plant, and then you discern all the other parts. Um, if you have a car or a bike, um, the car came before the uh, its wheels and every single part that composes it. In order to conceive the car as a whole, in order to create the 
the wheels and the engine and uh, the pistons and every single part. Someone had to have already the idea of a car in their minds. So conceptually, the car precedes its precedes all of its parts, and that is very that is a very interesting thought um, that I I saw also in Marx and. I found quite helpful in that sense because I I do I didn't I do consider Marx uh, very worth reading. Yeah, everything bends to the winds of the understanding. Da -da 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 -da. What else? Okay, this is all uh, for chapter one six three. So um, uh, paragraph one six three, infinity or this absolute unrest of pure self-movement in which whatever is determined in one way or another as being is rather the opposite of this determinateness. This no doubt has been from the start the soul of all that has gone before, but it is the inner world that it has first freely and clearly shown itself, appearance, appearance or, the play of for, or, or the play of forces already displays itself already displays it but it is as explanation that it first freely stands forth and in being finally an object of for consciousness as that which it is consciousness is that self-consciousness so this explanation comes first in gra this theory of gravity came before gravity in the sense that like from the moment we see anything in the world that doesn't make sense. We cannot see anything that doesn't make sense. We already create loss for everything that happens around us. When something doesn't make sense, we already like we don't we don't cognize it. We don't accept it in our uh, the mind does not accept it. The um, consciousness does not receive it until it has a sign a law in which it fits. In that sense, um, the appearance comes after the explanation. That is an interesting uh, inversion. So the concept uh, within the structure of the understanding precedes this uh, of perception. All the changes are lawful changes? A question mark. I because that is implies that like there are not there is no such a thing as quantum physics basically. This is nothing. I mean, and quantum physics is a way of creating a law for like a way of of again cognizing creating a. a a field in which it feels like uh, we can predict, uh, we can um, attach a certain um, classification to that. Um, because, um, yeah, because and because unlawful changes don't make sense. So why doesn't it exist? Because it doesn't make sense. It's not that it doesn't exist, it's that, I mean, whether or not things outside consciousness exist or not is a different discussion. But the thing is that whether they exist or don't exist is, um, is beyond our purposes. If we cannot cognize something, then it might as well not exist. There might, ghost might exist. There, there might be such a thing as a tetradimensional being that might be walking among us that we cannot perceive because we are three-dimensional beings. But can we perceive them? Obviously not. So they might as well not exist. We, within our own framework of, of building reality, it's as if they didn't. Uh, the understanding is only concerned with its own explanatory capacity. Nothing shows up in the understanding if it can't be explained. Again. And at the end of that paragraph, we arrived at self-consciousness. Any object that could um, have truth value comes to the understanding's own concepts. Comes through the understanding's own concepts. This um, in paragraph uh, 164, uh, the necessary advance from the previous shapes of consciousness from their truth was a thing and other than themselves expresses just this that not only is consciousness of a thing possible only for a self-consciousness but a self-consciousness alone is the truth of those shapes but it is only for us that this truth exists nor not yet uh, for consciousness but self-consciousness has at first come simply for itself and then in 165 he continues 
and I, I wrote, uh, yeah. So we arrive at, self, first of all, uh, we arrive at self-consciousness. It is only after arriving at self-consciousness that we can ask uh, what consciousness knows about knowing. And uh, in 165, uh, I wrote, the only thing behind the curtain that consciousness will The only thing behind the curtain of consciousness that it will or can experience is itself. Uh, yeah. And that would be the end of my notes on the book. Because I have a limited space. <laughs> and I I will see what I have missed on the computer. I don't, wanna, I don't like being back and forth. And see if uh, there's anything else to grasp here. So for 155, I wrote a uh, loss involve a kind of tautology. They are redundant. If something falls according to gravity, so the same note basically, that I had on the book. Any time the understanding grasps something necessary, it is something per, um, perception is something that perception could not grasp. So there is a differenti differentiation between the understanding and perception. This is what we were looking at before, with the contradiction as well. Um, like in a syllogism, right, we have the middle, uh, uh, the middle uh, premise or the claim that... Uh, does not connect that connects the f the the first one and the and the last one right um all things fall um i have uh, i all th um all bricks that are thrown fall down i this brick has been thrown this brick falls down right so uh, the um, the fact that all bricks fall and the fall uh, no and the brick itself are united in the middle premise but this brick uh, is 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 not all bricks what i mean is like we are extracting a universal from the particular this particular um the the but the universal is not um, um this is funny <laughs> but the, but the universe but the universal is 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 not in your experience when i take a brick and i throw it and the brick falls i cognize i i assume okay all bricks fall if i throw bricks they will fall um but i'm just so one brick fall so that is the explanatory law that we extract from that and that is a concept that is not um, an object of uh, perception the um, universality is not graspable in the real world. And uh, in that sense, uh, the law is not contingent, but it's also, yeah, wait, could not grasp. Perception, perception is always contingent, but the law itself is not. Because the law, the, the law is not uh, arrived at by perception, but by uh, deduction, by intelligibility, by infer uh, inference. Change isn't optional for appearances. Um, yeah. And on the, on the last paragraph, uh, we... The last thing that Hegel says uh, in the last paragraph is that consciousness uh, looks behind... Uh, yeah. Yeah, that's that's what I was what I said in the previous paragraph, which was actually from the from the one before. Nothing other than itself. And uh, yeah, I guess then I guess that's it. I made a nice drawing here at the end. Uh, if uh, consciousness looks through the phenomenic play of forces, it arrives at the law. Because in the interconnectivity and ever changing. A cycle of the phenomenic play of forces, we arrive at this pattern from which the law can be extracted. We don't need to see the pattern, we don't need to see the whole thing. In the moment there is a change, the law will be already necessarily and by reflex uh, extracted. Um, this might not have made a lot of sense. I, I think I'm, I'm probably gonna do something that I do when I don't understand something that I want to understand, which is I'll write and I say, I'm gonna sit down and actually put this down and write because it's much it's a superior way of thinking. 
and hopefully I'll be able to get back to you with more insights on this chapter. If that is the case, I'll uh, then uh, a posteriori come back to this video and link to whatever other video I make on further reflections on this chapter of the phenomenology in the description. But otherwise, um, don't be too harsh on your capacity or on your powers of the understanding. Uh, he doesn't make it easy. I'm certainly very, this is one of the very few times in which I was like, I think this is probably the time when I started zooming out the, pre the first time I read here, like a year ago or so. And I can see why. This time I do, I, I have um, received more, but it's been a while. So it feels very much like a first read again, since last time nothing really got through my head other than like the most obvious general things like the dialectic process. But um, I'm interested in seeing what's coming. I'm not eager to read it, but I'm interested in finding out. So I'll get back to you with more painful prose that promises to give you absolute knowing at some point. In next week, I guess next week. Yeah, that's it. See you on the other side. Thank you, Vokdov.